Hi, welcome to Psychology Matters. It's good to have you here today. I'm Diane Bradley. I'm with Franklin Counseling Associates and I teach in a program that trains counselors and therapists. And this is a program about different issues in psychology and mental health. And today, I'm really excited. I get to have someone that I think a lot of with us today, and that's Lisa Henderson. And Lisa is a licensed professional counselor, and in addition, you're president-elect of the Tennessee Counselors Association. Is that, is that right? That's right. Okay, it's so good to have you here today. Thank you for having me. And it's good to have someone here that we can share with our viewers some of the things, the interesting and difficult things about depression. Yes. And depression, you know, amongst people, depression in the family, and just how you and we work with that. Certainly. So I would say that's probably an area that you've, um, it's an issue, let's say, that you've dealt with more than once with clients. Absolutely. Um, depression is, is so common. So many people experience it. Mm -hmm. um, and they might not even know that that's what they're experiencing. So um, in some of the work that I do, uh, we go out and educate employers on depression and what they might be seeing in some of their employees that might look like disengagement or laziness or disinterest, um, all kinds of things that it, it may show up as, but it's really unrecognized, untreated depression. Yeah, and I would imagine that often the one that might be suffering from depression is not usually the one that decides to go get help. Is that's that right? That's very true. Yeah. Um, a lot of times uh, we've thought for a long time that one of the primary barriers to getting mental health care is access or money or transportation. Mm -hmm. um, recently there was a study released um, that actually showed it was ourselves getting in our own way mm -hmm. thinking I should be able to handle this. Mm -hmm. And so people often don't realize how hard it is until someone else says, hey, you don't have to live this way. You can yeah. get help for this. Yeah, and I would imagine, you know, I've, I've seen depression in some of my clients. I would imagine that for the most part, that's an attitude that a lot of men would have. Mm -hmm. I should be able to handle this, right? That is definitely a, a common uh, way of approaching depression. Right. Um, and, and men, very often, um, they might feel weak or unprepared mm -hmm. or um, as though they're, um, they don't have the grit that they're supposed to have. Mm -hmm. And so they just try to white knuckle their way through it, not realizing all of the unintended consequences of just trying to get through it. Yeah, yeah. And I, I heard someone say once that depression is contagious in a family. Um, I would imagine if you have a family member, especially if it's one of the parents that is suffering from the symptoms of depression, that that impacts every member of the family. Absolutely, right? yeah. it does. Um, when you have a parent who's uh, suffering with depression, they often um, are short-tempered. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they experience physical symptoms, so they're not present physically because they're in bed or they're tired, they're fatigued. Right. Um, a lot of times there, there's a huge comorbidity. So people who have um, depression might also have another chronic disease like diabetes or cardiovascular diseases. So they're unable to do things physically with the family. And um, you know, so it, it just impacts mm -hmm. the ability to function and thrive as a family unit. Oh yeah, I, and I think it's one of the hardest things for anybody to um, deal with on their own, for a family to deal with, and it can be difficult for clinicians as well because getting that person to come in right. and that person to stay engaged and to return, right. it might be one of the hardest populations to keep them consistent in working on that depression with their clinician. It is. Um, I have a, a client who I've worked with for many years, um, and, and she comes for depression treatment. Mm -hmm. And you know, along the way, we've identified some other things, and, and we've addressed those as yeah. well. Yeah. There's been some trauma. There's been some anxiety. 
Um, there's been some um, unhealthy uh, relationship interactions, mm -hmm. and her approach to everything is, what's wrong with me? Why is this so hard? Yeah. And it's, it's really uh, a challenge for me to help her see that depression doesn't necessarily just go away. Um, and so if, if, it's, if we're gonna treat this as a chronic condition that is gonna come back, um, one of the major uh, emphasis of our work together is having the resiliency to keep at it. And yeah. when she gets down again, know that it's gonna pass. Yeah, um, and, and I would imagine you give her strategies to manage it and reduce its effect. Yes, yeah. yes, so for her, um, you know, working through uh, the evidence-based practices protocols mm -hmm. and making sure that the, the strategies and the protocols that we're doing have some good research behind them, that I'm using um, the expertise that I've gained through my practice in being able to know what she needs and what's gonna be beneficial, and then also honoring her values and putting that at the heart of our treatment. Mm -hmm. um, working through that framework is really difficult because she chooses um, not to take medication, and she has yeah. the right to make that choice. And yeah. being able to be with her through her ups and downs, knowing that there's a really good chance that these ups and downs could be reduced, mm -hmm. that she could level out. Um, and then being able to say, you know what, though, it's your choice, and I'm here either way, and, and there are plenty of ways that we can manage this. Yeah, <coughs> well, that's really interesting. And I think that there's a lot of different ways that it can be managed, right? Yes. So let's just imagine a situation maybe a typical client, you know. Um, oh, let's think of a man, you know. Okay. Uh, let's call him Joe. Okay. And let's say Joe's wife has brought him in and um, it's taken a lot of work to get him in and she finally gets him in to see you. And you hear the symptoms and symptoms like he has no fun in anything. He can't find joy in anything. It seems like he's not interested in doing anything with me or the children, and I don't know what to do about it, but he needs help. So let's just you know, imagine that Joe's here to see you. How would you start working with Joe? What would you do? The first thing I would wanna do with Joe mm -hmm. um, is ask him, does he wanna be here? Okay. Does he, in, in the counseling session, mm -hmm. um, does he feel like there's any hope for getting better? Um, does he think that there's anything that needs to change? Um, so that I can understand where he is. Right. Because um, at this point, I have a really good idea of where his wife is. Mm -hmm. Joe hasn't said anything yet. Right. And so I would want to engage him and see, you know, if, if things are tolerable for him, then we would need to change gears. Um, because there's going to be a pretty low level of motivation to do anything different. If he um, expresses that, no, I'm not happy the way things are, I just don't know what to do yeah. about it, and her nagging me isn't helping, mm -hmm. um, then that tells me a, a very different direction to go in. Okay, okay, so let's imagine that you have this Joe who says, yeah, she's right, you know, and I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. I do need help, I just don't know where to start, mm -hmm. and I've been fighting it for a long time. Now where might you go? Can you remember a time before you felt this way? Yeah. Do you know when these feelings started? Mm -hmm. Do you know of anything that happened right before, during, or after mm -hmm. this change? Mm -hmm. What have you tried? Mm -hmm. Where have you turned for help? Have you talked to your physician? Yeah. So it's kind of a probing of finding out what all's going on in his world, mm -hmm. what he's tried, what has worked, what's not worked. Yes. So that you have a sense of, you know, just what his world is like. Right. Right? Okay. So um, what would you say about that in regard to children? Do you see children who present with depression? I do. Um, and, you know, working with children is a little bit different mm -hmm. in that, so much of what they're responding to is their environment. Right. And um, treating a child for depression is really challenging because mm -hmm. 
the child often doesn't have control over the situations that are causing the stressors that right. manifest in depression. Right. right. Um, and that's just a fact of life. So working um, early in my career, I worked in child welfare and, and did some uh, work with kids who were either at risk of foster care in or just coming out of foster care and talking to them about the things that made them sad and scared and lonely. They, they had some heartbreaking experiences yeah. that if they weren't experiencing depression, we'd be assessing for different things. Mm -hmm. So it was sort of natural. And, and normal and okay for them to experience that type of symptomology, what we had to watch for was how long does it last? Yeah. And yeah. Um, does it cause other problems? Does it prevent them from learning new things or cause them to not be able to do things that they've known how to do prior to now? Mm -hmm. So the, the assessment process is a little bit different right. um, and supporting them through it is a little bit different as right. well. You know, and you said something about I think is really important is how to know when something would be normal mm -hmm. even though it's not pleasant mm -hmm. it's not desirable but it would be normal for anyone to be experiencing the feelings that he or she might be feeling right if he's dealing with situations that he has no control of right and that in itself sometimes is very helpful to know that yes right? and I find a lot of people um, Early in my career, I was worried that if I normalized something, it would invalidate somebody's experience. Right. And so I was a little bit timid to do that. Right. Um, it had the opposite effect. It really did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, being able to help someone see that you're okay, this is mm -hmm. normal, this, mm -hmm. is, this is sadness, and yeah. sadness is not exactly depression. Yeah. Depression encompasses sadness, but you can be sad without being depressed then people who've experienced depression in the past feel sadness, they jump ahead and worry that they're going back into depression. Mm -hmm. Being able to normalize that for them is really empowering. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So do you see depression as something that's on the rise in your client base or do you think it's always been a pretty big issue? I think, um, you know, it's a great question. I don't have a definitive answer to it. Mm -hmm. um, from what I see, I would say that it's always been there. We've just called it different things. Right. Um, right. I think that there are a lot of manifestations of it that mm -hmm. we're starting to see. If we can peel back some of those layers, there's that underlying depression there mm -hmm. that if we, can, if we can address that, then everything gets better. On the other side of that, you can treat everything, and if you don't address the depression, then right. it'll just change shapes. Right. So it's pretty important for the counselor or the therapist to be able to tease that out and know that, to right. be able to work with that. Right. Well, I don't know about you, but I've been seeing teenagers, adolescents, presenting with something other than depression and then finding out that depression is there. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, that different situations with different people, but sometimes they don't have control. Right. And then sometimes they have more control than they realize. Right. Yeah. Right. One of my um, early mentors and my licensure supervisor, he used to tell me that, um, you know, when we would go through case presentations and, and we'd be talking about all kinds of different types of experiences of clients, he would always say something that was just so poignant, and I think it applies to most of the clients that I've worked with. Um, the problem isn't the situation. The problem right. is that I'm here and I ought to be there. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that happens a lot with depression as well, mm -hmm. that I'm sad and I ought not to be, right. or I'm having a hard time with this and I should be fine. And I do think that um, today's culture with social media highlight reels of everybody's you know best mm -hmm. life mm -hmm. going on all the time mm -hmm. and the abundance of comparison and um, you know the outward projection of a version of the self um, makes it really hard yeah. for people to feel like they don't quite measure up to what other people's right. experiences are right that and immediate gratification 
and immediate gratification. Yeah. Yeah. So do you find with your the folks that you've worked with that there's a tendency to self medicate sometimes? Absolutely. Yeah. And maybe we should break that down and explain what we mean by self medicating. Uh, some people know that, some people may not know just what that is. Can you share that? I sure that? can. Um, anything that you do to change the way you feel. So it could mm -hmm. be drugs or alcohol. It could be relationships or sex. It could be movies, writing. It could be church. Anything that um, you use to change the way you feel. And um, we sort of, I look at it in terms of to what degree. Mm -hmm. So if you are, I'm, I'm a runner and um, I love to run, and if I need to take a break, I can go for a run. But if I'm sitting in a session, and all of a sudden need to take a break, and the only thing I can do is go for a run, then we've crossed over into oh, yeah. what was a healthy coping skill has now become a self-medicating right. um, problem. You know, we see that a lot in the use of alcohol and drugs, mm -hmm. too, and we wonder why so many people resort to the use of that and often they're self-medicating, right. right? And the problem with it is, is they're taking themselves down even lower because right. it's a depressant, right. or at least alcohol is, mm -hmm. right? Yes, yeah. and alcohol in particular, um, it has been used for thousands of years as an antidepressant, mm -hmm. even before there was such a thing as an antidepressant. And so then also looking at you know, sort of the, the chemical structures of it being a central nervous system depressant, it, it, it has a sort of a double whammy. And if you're taking any other medications, then it's just exacerbating that. And so before you know it, you're in a place where you didn't necessarily intend to be. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about the different kinds of depression. That's okay. Sure. I'm not sure how many of our viewers know that there's different types of depression. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have that long, ongoing, it's been there for a long time, mm -hmm. right? That kind of depression. Mm -hmm. And that one, um, I actually really like working with clients with that type of depression mm -hmm. because I just see so much strength in people who um, live with that depression. Right, right. And it's also really exciting to see some of the developments that are coming. Mm -hmm. So there's that combination of, um, there's so much grit and determination in, in just having the faith and having the hope that tomorrow's gonna be better. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna see if it is, um, which I just admire so much. And then also the really interesting research that's coming out um, with using things like ketamine and TMS and you know, these other protocols that have not been on the market for very long and they're still you know, not widely accessible for people, but if they actually do what clinicians think they're gonna do, it's gonna help so many people. Oh yeah. So there's a, an interesting frontier oh, yeah. to that type of depression treatment. So let's compare that then with um, episodic. Okay. Um, depression, sure. short-term depression, you know, what do you see in that? With the shorter-term episodic depression, um, there's usually an event, a catalyst, um, that is really difficult to deal with, and it throws your whole world upside down, mm -hmm. and it just takes a while to put yourself back together again. Mm -hmm. And for some folks, um, that might mean that a medication is needed, for some therapy is needed, for some both are needed. Mm -hmm. um, and the research is getting fairly clear on we're starting to be able to predict who's going to need what, who's going to need what combination of medication therapy combination um, right. in order to help them get well. Right, right. Well, you know, when I think about depression, I think about um, how when when we fall into that, how we can feel hopeless and how it can feel like it'll never change, it'll never be yes. different. Where I am right now, this is it for me. Mm -hmm. So I wonder how, how do you work with that and how do you help that client that comes in and that's what you hear, mm -hmm. that's what you get from them. How do you put that little bit of hope in their pocket so that they can feel mm -hmm. like there's another day coming, I will get better. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? I, uh, I guess I could probably put it into three categories. 
um, the first thing I do is try to reflect back on a time when they didn't feel this way. You know, if, if you feel this way now and you think you're going to feel this way forever, can you remember a time when you didn't feel this way? And generally when they can tell me about that time, they can also tell me about times before and after where they've had some depressive episode, whether it's mild, moderate, or the chronic kind that we're talking about. So what that allows for is the, the ability to kind of say to themselves, I've been here before and I've come out of it. Yeah. And so that kind of gets them looking forward. So I, d I'm, I probably won't be here forever. Right, yeah. okay. right, even though it feels that way. Right. Um, and then another thing that we do is start looking at, you know, what, what would you be doing in life if you weren't feeling this way? Mm -hmm. And so we start to kind of just set goals. And um, one client in particular who I worked with a long time ago, he was never happier than when he was planning a trip. He was an adventurer. Um, and so he would, he, he could always go there. He could always say, if I weren't depressed, if I weren't feeling this way right now, I would be taken off, I'd be heading west, or, you know, I haven't been south in a while, or, you know, he would pick a place. Um, I haven't done the Appalachian Trail in 20 years. I think it's time. Mm -hmm. And so he would just, for the sake of the exercise, he would start planning the trip. And that would and get caught up in it. He would get caught up, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he would get excited. And before he knew it, he would come in and say, "I think I'm ready to take that trip," mm -hmm. which is great. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third thing is to sort of depersonalize it a yeah. little bit. Yeah. And we do that through sometimes humor, sometimes. Um, demonizing, sometimes personifying. It sort of depends on where the client is. So I've got one client where, um, you know, she really likes comedy and there's a comedian named Sarah Silverman and um, she's very funny and very crass. So if any of your viewers Google her, just know you're gonna, you're in for an earful. Um, but she talks a lot about her experience with depression and, um, and, and that helps. You know, that helps people feel not alone and also feel like, um, I can laugh at this because what she's saying is funny. Mm -hmm. um, and then other times we look at it and, and we demonize it and, you know, talk about what a liar depression is. That, yeah, it's you know, almost like you're externalizing it, mm -hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Wow. And yes. so it's taking, you know, instead of I am so depressed, it is this depression is trying to beat me down and it's lying to me and I don't have to fall for it. Right, right. This, this is really good information. Well, as we are nearing the end, yes. I, f I feel like we would be skipping something pretty important if we don't bring it up. And what if the depression is very severe and assessing for a situation where someone might be suicidal? Mm -hmm. Um, what do you do in those cases and, or how do you know if you have a family member or you know someone, what do you do in those cases? The, the most important thing is that I stay calm. Mm -hmm. um, people are often very scared of right. their own ability to keep right. themselves safe. Mm -hmm. um, family members are very scared of their ability to keep their loved ones safe. And so, um, you know, it, it, it's unsettling for people sometimes yeah. to share that. Yeah. Um, the biggest fear that I've encountered with my clients in particular is they're afraid that I'm going to take away their autonomy and I'm going to have them committed. Right. And so, you know, I always sort of start off with you, know, you have a right to think and feel the way that you do. And you, if you think that this is the only way for you to um, manage this, then I'm not going to try to convince you otherwise, but I'm also going to tell you that tomorrow could be better. Yeah. And the greatest tragedy is for someone to miss out on what tomorrow could bring. Right. And then we just go straight into, you know, assessing for can this person be kept safe? Are they motivated to be kept safe? Is mm -hmm. there anything to gain from them harming themselves? Right. Right. And and so it's it's a little bit of. Um, I would say a little bit of a dance, and it's a, it's a trust dance mm -hmm. that yeah. um, I need them to trust me. Right. So as we near our close, l let's say we've got an audience 
people in our audience that are wondering, and they may even be thinking of someone sure. if they're not thinking of themselves. What's a good first step for a person who knows of someone, even if it's self? Right. What's a good first step for that person to do if depression is what's going on? Um, well, I'd, I'd like to first say that if, if you have someone in your life who you are worried about harming themselves, mm -hmm. it is okay to ask them. You're not going to plant any ideas in their head. Right. You are not going to introduce right. something that they haven't already thought about. Right. So go ahead and ask that question and let them know that you care and right. that you're paying attention. Mm -hmm. um, then if the next step for whatever level of depression is seeking help and getting treatment, then I would say um, to start looking for a counselor yes. and a therapist. Um, yes. And whether you need to go through insurance or um, the exchange or looking on you know, just the internet for a sliding scale, start looking for a therapist and make sure that that person is someone that you feel comfortable with. But get help. Get help. Get help. And if there's mm -hmm. no one and you need immediate help, then a crisis line is okay. always available. Okay. You're really a wealth of information. Mm -hmm. And if I were depressed, I would feel very comfortable talking Good. to you. Thank you. You seem like a very safe person to talk to. Yeah. So I'm so glad that you could be here today, Lisa. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for all that you do and all that you do for licensed professional counselors and all of our mental health providers oh, as thank well. You. So I'd like to invite our audience to watch our future episodes. Look for this episode on Facebook. Uh, that's Psychology Matters TV. Be sure to like us and keep up to date on upcoming episodes. Thank you for being with us today, and have a good day.